Welcome back 4060 Wonners. This video will continue our discussion of pipes and their relation uh, FIFOs. Just to keep track of where your reading should be devoted, uh, be having a look at chapter 15 of Stevens Rago that surveys pipes in some more detail than we covered them previously, and begins discussion of these FIFOs, uh, which are essentially a named pipe, uh, one that's on the file system. The eighth homework, which you're working on right now, discusses this uh, file tree walks business, uh, but very soon we'll release homework nine, and this will move on to do some more detailed discussion of code related to pipes and FIFOs. And we'll get to discussion of what that might look like uh, towards the end of our presentation. Uh, it's very likely that that stuff will factor into a project later on in the semester. We left off last time with this introduction of a new entity uh, known as a FIFO. Uh, the name is chosen uh, after the data structures that have these first in, first out uh, semantics, that's the FIFO. And pipes themselves are a FIFO as well. I guess the Unix creators wanted some alternative name to distinguish this nameless pipe that is created via system calls from one that is more readily accessible uh, due to its having a place on the file system. Now, generally, the reason that both these exist is that a pipe is limited to be used by processes that exist uh, in the same process tree. Uh, this is a major limitation in that you have, usually have a parent process creates a pipe and then forks off one or more children. Those children and parents can communicate with each other through the pipes. But if you don't have any such hierarchical relationship in the process tree, uh, then there isn't an easy way for those standard pipes accessible through the system call pipe uh, to enable communication between uh, different processes. Uh, instead, you'll look for some place on the file system to put something related to pipes in order to make unrelated processes enable them to communicate with each other. This is the uh, uh, eponymous FIFO or named pipe as it were. These can be relatively easily created uh, on the file system using a shell a command. Uh, you can simply make FIFO uh, and establish a file name here and this will create on the file system a handle for what under the hood is actually just an internal operating system buffer the same as a pipe. Uh, you can name these things whatever you want. Uh, I'll use the convention uh, naming them .fifo, uh, but you can put whatever extension or file name you want associated with them. Uh, as is usually the case, Unix doesn't enforce any restrictions on how you name files. Uh, you can just hint at uh, what the file's uh, data might contain uh, using extensions. But under the hood, these aren't actual files, as in they aren't permanent storage, they aren't saved in the same way as normal files, uh, and so they'll have a different representation in some way uh, in terms of looking at file information through ls-l and stat, and we'll see that in just a minute. And the counterpart to this at the C level is the system called McFIFO. And like the shell command taking a file name, uh, there's a mention of a path here. Uh, this is uh, equivalent to that file name and where to create that new handle in the operating system, uh, or file system rather. Uh, and then in addition to that, the uh, McFIFO will take a set of permissions so that you can make this thing read, write, or whatever um, you want. Uh, anything that's at the shell level will inherit uh, from the uh, let's see, was it the user mask? Uh, I'm trying to remember what the, uh, the U mask, uh, yeah, this shell level variable that controls uh, what the permissions are associated with stuff. But you can change permissions using uh, chmod like other things in there. All right, so uh, that's enough sort of like uh, blathering on, on the, the, the system calls and the shell interface. Uh, let's see how this thing actually plays out in practice. The next slide details a little session, but it's probably more worthwhile to look at how this thing uh, works in an interactive section. Uh, so let me pull up over here a shell of some kind. And I actually have to be a little bit careful. I discovered earlier that um, uh, the uh, Dropbox system uh, that is present on my uh, computer doesn't interact very well with FIFOs. It does some weird things uh, with them. Uh, so I'm going to change instead and uh, go into this little uh, temporary directory I created in my home directory where Dropbox isn't going to interfere with operations so we can th see things act somewhat normally on that front. I may have a chance to say a few words on that uh, later on, but for the moment, um, let's just uh, work in this uh, temporary directory where things behave somewhat normally. 
So uh, standard sort of shell semantics associated with files are as follows. Uh, I can ex echo something like hello there uh, and redirect that output that would normally go into the screen uh, into a file uh, like, uh, let's see, x.txt. Uh, this means then that in this directory, I have this little x.txt file. Uh, and if I cat it out x.txt, uh, here's that stuff that I had um, plopped out earlier. And I can do that as many times as I want because the text file saves this information, the normal file on that front. And I'll enter the FIFO, which I can introduce using this McFIFO uh, shell command. Uh, and I'll just call this one x.fifo instead. Uh, the first thing you might want to do is to gather just a little bit of information about what is this thing and how is it different. Uh, if I do an ls-l at this point to list everything in the directory, you'll see here that normal file x.txt has a little dash at the front. And this is the designation that ls-l uses for regular files. On the other hand, the x.fifo above it, in addition to not having any size, uh, zero size, uh, that's in the middle here, it also has a little p at the beginning beginning here. And that's to indicate that this isn't a normal file anymore. Instead, it's a pipe. And this name, though it appears in the file system, is really just a, a sort of handle into an internal operating system buffer that behaves exactly like a normal pipe would uh, that you'd get through that pipe system call. Uh, the sort of normal pipe business uh, that we're associated with, uh, that we've seen previously, um, it has a set of semantics where there's a read end and a write end, uh, and we're about to encounter one of the bits of weirdness associated with uh, FIFOs uh, being that right now nothing has uh, anything open about this FIFO, neither its read end or its write end. Uh, and this is going to cause so a little bit of strange behavior. Um, so first and foremost, uh, let's just try something simple like echoing as we did before. Hello there. Uh, this time we'll echo it into x.fifo. And I want to point out importantly, this thing looks sort of like a file and you use the standard sort of redirection semantics associated with it. Uh, that it would be a mistake here to use a bar uh, because this will cause the shell to interpret left hand side as a command, right hand side as a command, and right hand side is not a command at all. Instead, uh, it's uh, something that looks more like a file. Uh, and so here I'll get a permission error where it tries to execute x.fifo as a program. It's not. It's uh, a pipe of sorts. So the correct semantics here are to try to, uh, to redirect inputs into this thing, as in I'm going to write hello there, and it should go into this uh, FIFO. And the first thing that we sort of encounter is that this stalls immediately. Uh, you can see my CPU is not churning too hard here, so it's not that this is some sort of infinite loop that's consuming CPU. Instead, there's only one program, uh, this echo command, that has the right end of this pipe open. Uh, and the operating system standard behavior associated with programs that are opening up pipes is that they should always show up in pairs. That if some program is opening up the right end, then it will cause that program to block until some other program comes along and opens up the read end. Um, so, for instance, uh, as is often the case, as I would encounter this kind of situation where this is stalled, I'll just um, kill it with an interrupt signal, uh, control C that. Uh, and if I similarly catted out x.fifo, uh, cat will open up this thing uh, in read mode and attempt to read all the contents out, uh, it similarly stalls. So I need to use these two in conjunction uh, with each other. Uh, to that end, a uh, standard way would be the following. I'm going to echo this, but I'm going to put this little ampersand in the back, which will start that program running, the echo here, uh, to run in the background instead. Uh, so I get immediate control back from, for the shell, and I can ask uh, what jobs do I have running. In the background, this thing is running, as it were, and that's air quoted uh, because it's really on hold by the operating system. It will take action as soon as some partner comes along to uh, open up the right end, or the read end of the pipe as the hello is writing into it. So we can do that uh, just by saying cat out what's in x.fifo, uh, and at this point, the two are paired. Uh, the general sort of behavior is going to be that this cat opens up the FIFO in, for reading, and that triggers the operating system to say, aha, this guy finally has a partner. I'm going to give him the go-ahead uh, to write into it. Once it's done, it'll close the right end of the FIFO. Uh, and probably moments later, the cat command will say, ah, I actually have something to read from the FIFO. I'll read it all out. 
uh, and then at some point issue a read, which gets me zero bytes back, which means there's nothing left in the FIFO. Uh, so I'll close up uh, the read end of that FIFO, um, thereby transferring information from one program to another one. Uh, now this is very roundabout compared to uh, the standard mechanism, which would just have you uh, doing something like uh, echoing here into a standard pipe and then putting the cat program on the, the, the right-hand side of it, say, uh, take a standard input, this stuff, and, and cat it out. Uh, but what we're sort of getting at here is that uh, these two programs, the echoing of hello there and the catting that happens later, uh, these don't necessarily have to be related as started in the same shell over here. Uh, so for instance, uh, I can uh, start out an echo over here and then fire up a new shell. Uh, just let me change into this temp uh, FIFO code. Uh, and at this point, I'm in a completely different part of the process hierarchy that's unrelated to this Emacs shell. Uh, but over here, I can cat out that x.fifo uh, and get the data over here. Meanwhile, uh, over here, if I press enter, I'll see that this thing has actually finished up on that front. Um, so this allows unrelated programs to communicate uh, through FIFOs. Uh, up to this point, we've only ever like really done this um, uh, catting business, and I don't want you to get the impression that all you can do is read out the data from a FIFO and spit it onto the screen. Uh, instead, you can do all manner of things, uh, as in any program can open this thing up and read to from it or write to it. Uh, so for instance, uh, this sequence command uh, prints out numbers in sequence. Uh, it's sort of like a Python range in that point uh, matter. Uh, if I push this into x.fifo, uh, and I'll start that in the background so I can start another command, uh, and then uh, launch a word count, uh, which will tell me how many lines, words, and characters are coming in terms of data. Uh, I can start that on x.fifo, uh, and this will get me a count of 10 words, 10 lines, uh, and 21 characters total that are coming out of this. And you can see that little sequence uh, business uh, happen later. Uh, you can also uh, stack these somewhat. So here is a sequence of 10. Uh, here's a sequence of 50. Also going to x.fifo. I'll start that up. Uh, and if I now do a word count on FIFO, uh, you'll see that uh, here I get 60 total lines. That's 10 from the first and 50 from the second. Uh, and then some number of characters count it. And that completes both of these jobs. Uh, as in uh, the first finishes its output, the second finishes its output, uh, and then uh, word count finishes up because there's nothing left to read in the FIFO. So this should give you a sense of some potential for FIFOs that uh, I can start a program that is gonna work with this FIFO at some early point, and then come along later and start some other programs that are gonna work with uh, the other ends of that FIFO uh, to potentially do it. And this is one of the primary reasons to talk about FIFOs is that uh, if you don't have the ability to start all the programs that need to communicate at once, uh, then FIFOs are probably a better option than your standard pipe because they'll still allow for pipe semantics to be used uh, irrespective of the process relationships. So again, uh, this uh, slide over here sort of summarizes some of the behavior that's there and you'll wanna make sure that you understand that unless a program has a partner uh, that is operating on the other side of the FIFO, uh, either the read or the write side, uh, it will very likely stall. We never encountered that situation in terms of the standard pipes with the system call pipe because uh, what you'd see early on in recalling uh, how pipe works as a system call is that issuing it actually opens up two file descriptors, both the read and the write end. Uh, this means then that as a process uh, tries to establish one of these anonymous pipes, it automatically has both the read and the write end open, and so it doesn't stall. Uh, in, in contrast, uh, then after doing so, uh, of creating this pipe, it's very likely that the process would spin up maybe some other process and would close one end, and the other process would close the other end so that they would one would be reading and one would be writing. But we were never in this situation where here's this pipe and I'm opening it the first time but on one side, but the other side isn't open. 
one of the tricks uh, that we'll come to understand uh, that sort of uh, explains uh, how you can avoid some of this hangingness uh, business uh, is to emulate that behavior that we saw with uh, normal pipes uh, uh, using FIFOs. Uh, and to that end, one of the tricks that we'll see later on in homeworks and in projects is to open up FIFOs both in read and write mode, uh, although this has some other sorts of expenses that we um, uh, will, will, will sort of incur uh, that create uh, some, some weirdness associated with those semantics as well. Uh, in terms of your textbook material, uh, Steven Zarego actually discussed this issue and another way to get around it that we won't explore. Uh, it's possible to open some files in with the non-block uh, mode bit set, uh, which means normal operations that would cause the process to hang, waiting on some I.O. condition to be met. Uh, this can suspend those normal semantics. Uh, one of the benefits is then uh, on opening a FIFO, uh, you don't have to worry about other part, but this is a bit much and uh, there are some other ways around it uh, that we can guarantee will still work out fine. So we won't dwell on that non-blocking IO to any great extent. All right, so then uh, we'll want to spend a little bit of time formalizing the difference between your standard pipes and FIFOs uh, and normal files, uh, regular files as they were. Uh, to do that, we'll need to revisit some of the uh, items that we attended to earlier in the class and uh, formalize some of them. Uh, in particular, we, when we first introduced this notion of files, uh, it is the case that uh, we saw the operating system maintain certain internal information such as a position in the file in order to accommodate subsequent uh, reads and writes uh, from a process. And what we noticed is that there's actually a difference then if you open up a normal file and then fork a child versus if you fork a child and then open up uh, a file. And we'll want to recall those differences and contrast them in the same situation uh, against the FIFOs that we have now. Uh, now, since we're now in a position to work with FIFOs uh, that exist independent of any process, we actually observe some of these semantics in more detail and, and we'll do so. Uh, and as evidenced up here, the main demonstration program for this is this uh, multiple writes.c program. And it's going to allow for each of these four cases uh, to be uh, illustrated. Uh, that a process opens up a normal file and then forks a child, uh, and then both the parent and the child write information to that. It'll be an invocation of multiple writes as pre-fork, as in this is when to open up the file before forking. To open up a normal file uh, versus a FIFO down here. Uh, to call the file this uh, and to uh, output for both parent and child 20 lines. So there should be uh, 40 lines of output total uh, being written. Uh, alternative to that, uh, I could instead of pre-fork opening, uh, post-fork opening, as in the process forks and then both the parent and child independently open up uh, the file. Uh, and then contrast that with the FIFO versions of this, that pre-fork uh, open up a FIFO and then fork child uh, and post-fork first fork and then open up uh, the FIFO both in the parent and the child process, each then attempting to read. So uh, to summarize that, the next slide lays out the code for each of these cases. Uh, Pre-fork, that's open uh, and then fork and then have the child and the parent both write some child parent lines in there. Post-fork, uh, that's fork first open uh, and then iterate through child prints child stuff, parent prints parent stuff. Uh, the only difference then down here is that we'll make a FIFO and open it in these cases three and four, but the ordering will be the same. Open, then fork, fork, then open uh, down here. Uh, it may appear at first that I need sort of laborious code that looks sort of like this stuff in order to accomplish this. Uh, but having a look at this multiple rights code actually illustrates this. You, you can ar uh, um, arrange for this kind of multiplicity in behavior uh, fairly readily if you have the right set of if then else's. Uh, let's have just a quick look at that uh, bit of code. Let's see, uh, multiple rights. Let's see, here we are. Okay, so uh, there'll be a buffer involved and the maximum size for it is 1024. Uh, but the rest of this code uh, fits almost in a screenful uh, over here. I need to process a bunch of arguments, uh, whether it's uh, open pre-fork or post-fork, that's the first argument, whether or not to use a file or a FIFO, the name of that entity and how many iterations all 
you know, reasonably boring stuff. Uh, one of the early lessons I learned in putting these examples together is it's a good idea just to get rid of that file using a remove or unlink system call uh, because anything that's left in it can sort of create confusing, confusion about what's actually in the file or FIFO later on. Uh, but essentially, uh, the first check here is if I need to create a FIFO, then make use of this low-level system call, McFIFO, uh, to create something that's at least uh, readable and writable by, by me as a user. If it's a standard file, uh, then you'll see later on as we open, I'm going to pass this oCreate flag, which will automatically create that file uh, if it doesn't exist already. To that end, then, uh, the next step is just to determine if the if-then-else, uh, should I fork now or should I fork later? And a pre-fork uh, will cause uh, the opening business here uh, to cause the parent to open up the file first and then fork. Uh, but if uh, the forking option uh, for opening files doesn't uh, match this pre-fork, then it'll be this post-fork. And so later on, after the fork happens, uh, then we'll um, open up that stuff. So this code structure then doesn't exactly match uh, what shows up uh, in the slide here in terms of the exercise, that I don't need cases for each of these things if I'm clever about how I orient uh, the if-then-elses. The remainder of the code is fairly straightforward. Uh, format some messages with either parent or child, uh, and then write those messages to the file descriptor. That file descriptor is going to be associated either with a regular file or a FIFO, and we'll see some differences associated with that. Everybody close it up at the end. Let's uh, take just a moment to contemplate whether or not you expect different behavior in each of these cases. And if so, what do you expect to be in the files or FIFOs that are output there? Formulate your guesses, your hypotheses. Uh, pause the video if you want a moment to think. Uh, and then we'll pick up in just a moment discussing actual behaviors on that front. So hopefully that's long enough for you to formulate a guess. Uh, it should be said that this earlier version, uh, this is actually review. So it's a good look back uh, and it'll allow us to contrast uh, the semantics uh, associated with FIFOs to relate them to how this interacts with uh, 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 files. Uh, if I remember right, I've already got, uh, nope, I have to say I uh, clobbered the file that's uh, in here. So let me copy this, uh, what's this be, 4061, lectures 09 and... Uh, the code version of this, and that's that multiple rights.c. Okay, so I'll just copy it in here so I can GCC it. Uh, multiple rights and uh, multiple rights. Okay, uh, so running this multiple rights business, I need to pick first is it a pre fork or a post fork file creation? Uh, follow the ordering up here. So we'll start with this pre fork business. Uh, so this will be pre fork. I work work with normal files for the moment. Uh, I'll just call this uh, out.txt. And I'll have 20 iterations uh, from both the parent and the child. Run this thing, get an immediate response. And over here, I will open up uh, the directory and say, here's my out.txt. Uh, and what's present in it are a whole bunch of lines. They are coming both from parent and from child. Uh, they appear to be interleaved. Uh, and if you look down here at the line count, I've got 41 total uh, that counts this line. So there are 40 lines total uh, in this file. That means if both parent and child are writing, then uh, writing 20 lines, I uh, haven't lost anything, uh, that the operating system has coordinated to this parent and child in some way. I want to look at uh, more precisely how that works. Now, from run to run, I wouldn't expect the same exact output to appear over here. So as I uh, run several times here, uh, I don't know that uh, over here, I'm going to refresh maybe uh, alt.txt. Yeah, okay, so the ordering of some of the uh, interleaving has changed. I got three parents, four parents up here, and then a child, and then interleaving. So uh, subject to the whims of the scheduler, I'm not necessarily going to get the same output every time as I run this stuff. But importantly, I haven't lost anything here. And that's the big change that we'll see uh, if I open up the file after forking, so a post fork open. Uh, then, and right here, uh, keep in mind that uh, this is going to change because I'll remove that file and then I'll overwrite what's in it. Uh, so pressing enter at this point, uh, I'm not getting my refresh as fast as I want, so I'll just do it manually. And you see I have much less output at this point. Uh, only 23 lines here have been armed. 
Uh, then you can see there's some garbling here uh, that I have the first 20 lines of the child, like that seems uh, apparent, but then there's a little bit afterwards in terms of the parent. I'm not even sure like where, where the, a lot of that is coming from. Uh, similarly, if I run this several times, I'll probably get uh, different, potentially different results. Uh, for instance, I could uh, jump this up to 100, uh, and that would probably change uh, somewhat what I see here. Uh, yeah, some additional stuff from the parent right here, but uh, whereas if I were expecting no data loss with 100 lines each from parent and child, uh, I've definitely lost stuff because I'm only uh, at 110 lines of, of code right now. And so something is lacking in terms of parent and child not coordinating on this file. The easiest way to understand this is to examine some pictures, and we did something like this early on. Let me zoom this in just a little bit so that it's maybe a little easier to see some of the fine grain details. The first part of this diagram shows what happens if you open first and then call fork. And as per the uh, semantics of forking, a parent that has uh, open stuff and has kernel space where its file descriptor table has an open file, when you fork, that kernel space that's associated with the process gets duplicated. The net effect is that the child shares a pointer to the internal kernel structures associated with that open file. And importantly, the operating system as one of the things it tracks is this process, which called open, has some internal kernel data structure that tracks the position for that file. Uh, one open means one of these uh, data structures. And so when the fork causes this uh, set of stuff to be duplicated, essentially all you get for the child is a pointer to that thing. There was only one open call between uh, parent and child uh, and that happened in the parent. So they're both sharing this uh, internal structure that gives the right position for the file. That means when the, or the parent writes to this file, that position advances. Uh, and the child will see that position advance. When it writes, it won't uh, overwrite what's at the parent because it's appending then onto what's there. Uh, to that end, the operating system automatically coordinates uh, then these two by virtue of this shared file position. Uh, and that's gotten via the duplication of pointers to it uh, through the open and then fork paradigm. In contrast, when you would uh, fork off a child that shares some things that were open at the time uh, with the parent, in particular the keyboard and the screen in terms of their standard input and standard output. Uh, but if these two separately open, then each open gets its own internal position in the file. So you have one for the parent and a separate one for the child. Uh, this is why then as the parent writes something, uh, it will overwrite bytes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. But then that doesn't advance the write position for the child, which if it issues a write, will overwrite things starting at position 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And that limits then the output that you'll see in the shared file um, associated with it. So these I nodes again are the actual storage uh, that's associated with um, the, the files themselves. So this is review, but uh, it's good review, uh, and we're about to sort of contrast it uh, versus what if these two things weren't files, they were FIFOs instead. Uh, first, let's observe. Uh, so over here, I'm going to kill this buffer and we can get rid of out.txt. Uh, I'm going to rename this out.fifo instead and change this thing to FIFO, and we'll start with the pre-fork business. Uh, I want to make this uh, somewhat more limited. Uh, as I punch enter now, uh, the first thing that you'll notice is this hangs. Uh, and similar to what we observed earlier, as you would be echoing inputs uh, into uh, a FIFO, there's only one end of that FIFO that's open at this point. And if you examine carefully the code in multiple writes here, uh, you'll see that in both the file and the FIFO case, I'm opening this with flags that indicate write only. Uh, to get around that, uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, kill this one and instead start it in the background. This gives me control back to the shell uh, and I can cat out this out.fifo. The first program is opening the right end of the, uh, of the FIFO, and this cat is opening the read end, so they're paired now, and I'll get all the output coming out of this thing. Uh, more or less as expected, I see parents, I see child uh, here, and to that end, I haven't lost any data on that front, and this is good, uh, because uh, it's the, the case 
um, that these two things uh, are uh, sort of coordinated and similar to the uh, what I observed for the files where I would open and then fork. Uh, there's no data loss in, in this case. Uh, let me do the following. I'm going to cat out. No, no, I'm right. I'm not going to cat right now. Um, I guess, uh, so, so far what we've observed is that this seems to behave the same way for FIFOs as it did for, for files. Uh, let me come back up here and change this pre-fork to post-fork. A uh, little ampersand here. Uh, I'm going to punch enter, which will start this in the background. And if I cat out this out.fifo, uh, I'll be interested to see if there's any data loss. And what you'll see up here is there isn't. Uh, that the parent and the child have their data interleaved somewhat, potentially in an unpredictable order. Uh, but unlike the case where I had this file uh, and the parent and the child were stepping into each other's output and overwriting it, the FIFO seems to have coordinated this even though the parent and the child separately opened it up. And this is starting to hint at one of the advantages of FIFOs that um, irrespective of when two processes open it up, they will automatically be coordinated in terms of their use of the FIFO. Best way to understand this is to look at some more pictures, which show up uh, later on. The original picture here uh, is associated with either a pipe or a FIFO that a parent opens, uh, and what it gets is a special kind of handle into an operating system RAM buffer uh, that is known to be a FIFO, and has a different set of semantics than your standard file, uh, and that there's a read position and a write position, but these are actually separate positions, and the operating system is tracking them. Similar to the file situation, on forking, uh, you get pointers to the same thing over here. So both the parent and the child, they're pointing the same FIFO over here and will be coordinated on that front. So this shouldn't come as a great surprise. What is a little more surprising is uh, the, the second case where I fork first and then uh, open up the FIFO both in the parent and the child. The reason that FIFOs behave differently is that Unlike files, where everything that opens them uh, has a sort of separate position, the operating system doesn't do this on a per-process basis. It does these positions on a per-FIFO basis. And so all of the processes that might be dealing with this FIFO, they see the same set of positions that are coordinated by the operating system. Uh, that essentially all the uh, processes know is that I've got this handle, this FIFO, there's a read position and there's a write position. Uh, and if this first process, the parent writes to that, it advances the write position in the pipe. Uh, and that is seen so that the child writing will not overwrite what the, the, the parent did, that it's instead going to write after that into the FIFO. To that end, then, uh, there's a great advantage, then, if you want to coordinate the output or input of several different unrelated processes, uh, a good way to do that is to make use of FIFOs uh, or pipes. Uh, FIFOs have the advantage that you don't have to establish the separate processes uh, in the same process hierarchy. Uh, no one needs to be uh, another's parent. Instead, they can be started up separately on that front and will automatically see this coordination uh, present there. And this explains, then, why you didn't get any data loss over here associated with parent and child. A natural question uh, might be quickly to ask uh, in the first case where I opened and then forked, why is it that I am uh, getting sort of all parent and then all child outputs uh, versus down here, there's a lot of interleaving happening there. I can't answer that easily. And it's likely again is due to factors that are out of our control, uh, such as the scheduler and when it decides it's going to allow things to happen. But there may be some more interaction um, with the scheduler in terms of these two separate processes opening up the FIFO separately versus up here, they're sharing that. Um, that might induce some more coordination on it. But the most important point I want you to get out of this is that in either case, uh, the FIFO didn't lose any data. And that's not something that happened with files. Uh, two separate processes, opening up a file and both uh, crunching data into it. Uh, by default, you have problems uh, with uh, sort of data being overwritten there potentially. All right. So uh, let me return to our regularly scheduled sort of program on that front. Uh, a couple lessons uh, that are partly review, but also partly new information on that front. Uh, and this is just a good chance to reflect back on this file descriptor table that's associated with each uh, process. Uh, we've seen again that these are kernel data structures that are managed by the OS kernel. And the little number that you have in your own program, uh, number, uh, let's see, uh, 
uh, okay, because it's number three in each case uh, down here. Uh, so the open gives a three and the separate opens down here give a three over here. That's just a handle to something that's pointed to in one of these tables. And we see now that it's not always file stuff uh, as it was before, uh, that it might also be stuff that's associated with those FIFOs. Behind the scenes, the operating system uh, might not actually have a permanent storage uh, bit of business for this file descriptor. Instead, it might be referring to a FIFO that exists only in RAM. Uh, and that has a couple disadvantages we'll talk about later on, but certainly it's very fast to read and write to, uh, which is why uh, these FIFOs are favored for quick communication between uh, processes. Uh, but again, the fork semantics associated with the file descriptor table will duplicate it, and any, trans any entries that already exist will be shared between uh, parent and, and child. Uh, this is also a chance to sort of look back and see, oh, there are these inodes, they correspond to files that are on disk, uh, but pipes don't have any inodes associated with them. Uh, that instead, they're an internal operating system communication buffer, and they don't correspond to any per personal uh, sort of uh, permanent storage. I think we've talked about uh, sort of um, most of this stuff in here. It's just worthwhile mentioning that if you open a file multiple times, uh, then you'll have multiple uh, sort of open file handles associated with it and potentially multiple positions in it. Uh, and we'll have to coordinate on your own. Uh, on the other hand, opening up a FIFO several times, this gives you a pointer to the same internal storage and that'll be coordinated. Uh, that's true for a single process or true for multiple processes and is uh, then worth knowing about if you're trying to coordinate those processes. Uh, the last thing then I want to mention about this uh, is that uh, FIFOs aren't a, a cure-all, that in many cases, uh, f uh, if you want permanent storage, files are, are good for that. Uh, but the fact that FIFOs allow for this automatic coordination between multiple unrelated processes makes them very advantageous uh, when you have certain paradigms for program communication, such as simple servers uh, and clients that want to access that server. This diagram comes out of Stevenson Rego and illustrates some of the common paradigms that you'd see. Uh, for instance, uh, clients uh, that are program processes that are starting at a different time than a server that has something that it does uh, for the clients. Oftentimes, you would get the client to be able to make requests to the server by establishing on a single computing system some sort of well-known FIFO that when you want to send something to the printer, then you establish a printer process that is going to manage that hardware uh, and some sort of a FIFO that will manage requests coming in from I want my Microsoft Word document printed. I've got to put something in the FIFO to indicate that. Uh, and a separate user, well, a separate client, uh, wants their PDF of lecture slides printed, uh, so they would also write a request in the FIFO. The fact that these are unrelated processes and potentially even being run by two different users uh, means that you need some level of coordination so they don't step on each other. And the FIFO, as an operating system vehicle, automatically provides that. If instead you need some communication back to clients, uh, very often the client will set up some little FIFO of its own and then write into one of these um, uh, well-known uh, FIFOs for a server to say, I'm going to tell you something, but when you want to talk back to me, part of my write message here is, here's my FIFO, so talk back to me. So the server will write separate requests back to clients on that part. We will demonstrate this paradigm in a future homework and probably make use of it later on uh, associated with uh, a small chat client project that we'll do towards the end of the semester. And there we'll see that FIFOs are a very useful vehicle when you have a program uh, that, or several programs on the same computing system managed by the same operating system uh, that all want to talk to each other and be coordinated on that front. This will also pave the way to understand some of the basic semantics associated with network communication. As in the FIFO paradigm here, a well-known FIFO uh, that clients can sort of join on uh, and then having a specific kind of FIFO that the server communicates back to them. This is the same basic setup that is used in internet communications uh, through the Unix socket mechanism. Uh, that usually a server type program, such as a web server, would establish a well-known address at which it could be contacted, which involves a machine name and also a port and socket number. 
when a client program, such as a web browser, wants to retrieve a web page, it will, over the network, communicate with that specific location. Uh, but then to have uh, communications that are uh, tailored back to that client as part of this socket infrastructure, uh, a sort of client-specific socket or FIFO is set up uh, that the server talks back. And the big difference will be then that the client and the server aren't on the same computer anymore. They're talking across the network instead. That'll be, uh, if we have time for it, the sort of closing element of this class. But most of the groundwork is laid by understanding some of the semantics of how one can use FIFOs, a sort of older and more primitive communication device uh, for single computers. That'll be all for now. I will see you guys next week, uh, or at least you'll hear from me next week, about our next topic, which is going to discuss inter-process communication mechanisms. Uh, this will expand somewhat on the primitive kinds of things that you can do to coordinate using a FIFO by introducing uh, some interesting operating system devices uh, that allow resource acquisition uh, and stalling if it can't be acquired. Uh, these tend to be uh, your standard semaphores uh, and also then communication between programs using shared memory devices. Uh, this will start to lay the groundwork of getting gangs of cooperating processes uh, to uh, work with each other on it. I uh, hope to see you then, or, or at least for you to hear me uh, then. Uh, and if you have any questions, do make sure to stop in our regularly scheduled uh, lecture hours where we'll be having discussions of this stuff. Happy hacking, and I'll see you next time.